right, well, welcome to another Noyo Center for Marine Science Science Talk. Let me welcome Daniel Gossard to you this evening. He comes to us. Are you in, where are you, Daniel, in this moment in time? In, um, I'm in Marina in California, um, near the center of uh, Monterey Bay, so oh, in central nice. California. Perfect. Yeah, so all the way from Monterey um, and through Moss Landing um, and San Jose State. And uh, you've kind of fallen into your favorite area of the ocean, it sounds like. And that's why you're here to talk to us about kelp. So with that, I hand it over to you, Daniel. Thanks for being with us tonight. And thank you everybody for joining us. Enjoy the talk. Thank you again for having me at the Noyo Center for Marine Science. And uh, my name is Daniel Gossard. And I, again, I'm in Marina, California. I'm a research technician at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. And I'm the chief scientist at Monterey Bay Seaweeds, uh, chief scientist in quotes, air quotes. We have five employees. So it is what it is. But um, I'm here to talk to you about seaweeds about this wonderful species right here. This is bull kelp. Uh, I took this uh, after I was finished with my thesis, uh, which was also on bull kelp and one of the species that grows on it. But I'm not here to talk to you about my thesis. I'm here to talk to you about um, some work that we've been doing recently, some work that we've been doing in, in Albion, and some work that we've been doing in Moss Landing. And this, this is happening at the same time. We are trying to use aquaculture, land-based aquaculture techniques to enhance the restoration of the bulk help Neurocystis lutkaana. Let's see here. And so again, I, 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 I wear two hats. I am uh, a research technician at Moss Landing where I, I do field work, I do microscopy, I build infrastructure, but I'm also the scientist at Monterey Bay Seaweeds where I develop a uh, number of species uh, in land-based aquaculture um, where chefs can make these, these beautiful dishes such as you see in the bottom right of this bulk kelp. Um, and I developed the infrastructure as well for expansion of this, uh, of this land-based seaweed farm. And uh, through, through this, through the development of a hatchery for, um, our, um, for our seaweed farm, uh, what came out was something pretty, pretty wonderful. Um, and so right now I'm here to talk to you about this species, Neriocystis, or, or really why it's not here. And this is, it's super concerning um, that it's not here. And, but we really have to look at this um, from also from a historical perspective. And we are really privileged to have access in this age to, to satellites. And um, actually, let's, let's go over an overview first. So I'm gonna be talking about the ecology, natural history, and uh, pr some previous restoration efforts. Um, and then I'm gonna be going into conservation aquaculture, um, what we've been doing at Moss Landing. Um, and in, uh, as a follow-up, uh, we have our methodology both at Moss Landing and um, our method methodology with our partners with the project going up going on in Albion and the what's next for uh, for this project. Unfortunately, we're midway through the project, so I don't have any data for you. I would love to show you some data, but I don't have it. Um, and you, you might be thinking if you're not a scientist, that's great. I don't like graphs. But there are plenty of those in the, in the introduction, so I'm afraid you're going to have to sit through those. Um, I do have some pretty pictures um, for, of our site um, and of the work that we've been doing. So um, if you look in the top, you're going to see what section we're in, um, just as a, a little overview. So satellites. Satellites, we're really privileged to, to be in this age because we can use satellites as a, as a proxy for measuring uh, the health of some of these canopy kelps. So we're looking at two sections here in Northern California, north and south of Point Arena. Um, in, the, in the far left, you have the, the orange triangle, uh, the orange square um, showing the section uh, that corresponds to the graph on the right. 
and the gray one is is corresponding with the the the, the kelp coverage south of Point Arena. And if you look on the y-axis of the graph on the right, it's on a log scale. So at the bottom, you have one square kilometer of maximum coverage in the summer. And on the top of that axis, you have 500 kilometers squared. So this is a pretty significant difference. And what you see here, really important, is that this canopy fluctuates. This canopy fluctuates naturally through this system. From, and this is the maximum extent, remember that. So this was, this was based off of satellite imagery. And notice, you might notice in the year, this cuts off at 2013. And this paper is from a paper published in 2021. I'll get into that in just a moment. So what this paper did was they took um, what they determined as a multivariate ocean climate index essentially the winter conditions in central and Southern California. And they've tested the hypothesis that these conditions were able to determine the extent of this coverage of the, of the amount of, of canopy in, in Northern California. And right now we're looking at these graphs, we're just looking at um, North of Point Arena. Um, so, the R squared uh, the coefficient of determination was really high, representing that the model that they derived from this relationship was really representative of the data. So that blue line, if you uh, blue line in the in A and C, if you translate that over to um, to the right graphs, you have in black the model that's the blue line in relation to those those that, those con winter conditions. That is pretty representative of what was measured for the extent of the summer canopy. So this is really important here. The winter conditions have historically determined the, the coverage of kelp in Northern California. And so it's, it's, it's important to notice that these winter conditions, as you might have, have guessed or if you already know these winter conditions are, are variable and this is based on a number of factors that i'm not not going to go into um but essentially there there are uh, cycles in ocean temperature we're, we're talking about pacific Day, decadal uh, oscillation we're talking about the el nino southern oscillation where the relative temperature of that year or that winter is going to be lower or higher relative to the the average and so as you can as you can imagine there are years that are going to be a lot higher is going to be years that are a lot lower um, i'm leading into this but you can think of the the warm water blob in 2014 2016 a lot higher and so before we get any further i do want to talk to you about uh, bull kelp because this is really important bull kelp does not like the high temperatures we have a species that is an annual species that, you know, if you were looking from the shore, if you were looking from satellites, you're going to see the, the, um, the spring to the uh, typically the, the early winter in Northern California canopy coverage, which is going to be changing relative to um, the season because these species are annual. And they, they arise from the substrate. Um, let, let's start with the, 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 the canopy. The canopy um, kelp drops what in the top right you can see. Um, I'm holding up a, uh, a blade that has a reproductive structure called the sorus. And this sorus is tissue that is, is going through meiosis to produce um, these myospores that um, they germinate into the microscopic stage of this kelp. So what you see on the surface, this giant canopy kelp also lives in an, an alternate life history on the seafloor in this really microscopic stage. And this microscopic stage um, starts off at less than 10 microns um, and it, it it, it pretty much goes through that part of the haploid life history um, in a really small size, all microscopic. You're not gonna be able to see this in the wild. 
Um, eventually, and, and as a consequence, when they're, because they're really small, they have to be really close together in order to germinate, um, to, to, to uh, fertilize uh, the female microscopic stage eggs. So imagine uh, th these are males and females, and they need to be really close together. So by dropping the, these, these reproductive structures the, uh, that are on the blade, they actually, uh, what's called, they, they go through the process called abscission, where tissue, you can see on the top right, there's a white band of tissue that is around the source, and that eventually decays, and these, the source with all these spores drops all the way to the seafloor. And in the process, um, these spores are, are, are sort of spewing out. And to give you a perspective, we're, we're talking about millions, tens of millions, and hundreds of millions of spores in what I'm holding up. So we're talking about a very, very large number of spores that are coming out of just one of these. And these, these reproductive structures are produced by the bull kelp as, as uh, the blades grow, grow further. Um, so the blades, these structures um, that produce these, these sori, they're growing closer to that, the air sac uh, the nematocysts, they're growing starting at um, that location. That's where the meristematic tissue is that they're growing out. They're growing, they're growing apical. And so as they go, as they grow further and further, then these sori develop and then the, the, the most uh, ripe sori are going to be more towards the apical portions of these. And so again, the, uh, the matocyst is going to be uh, more basal to that. It's, it's going to be responsible for them floating. This type is connected, is the long uh, stem-like tissue that's connected to the holdfast, where the holdfast is going to be attached to the rock. And so this is a really unique re uh, reproductive strategy because of abscission, particularly, um, as well as this is one of of some that some kelps are both perennial and annual. So this is a really this is an annual species. So going back to our physical oceanography, it's really important when um, when there are prolonged heat waves such as the 2014 and 2016 uh, marine heat wave, because over multiple years the the nearest is going to be is going to really be negatively affecting. Uh, affected, uh, especially because it goes through an annual cycle and because um, it's going to be uh, not providing more of these, these sori to the seafloor, these spores to the seafloor. The microscopic stays cannot be uh, replenished as compared to a really cold year. And so uh, you see the consequences, again, because of satellites. Uh, the canopy area over multiple sites, you can see from the left 1985 all the way to 2020, really at the stark um, demarcation was at 2014 where the, you know, this heat map starts going blank. And 2020, there, there still are um, uh, a huge losses. Uh, and it's really important, really, really important that those losses isn't, aren't a complete bar because the ability to, of nereocystis to recover is going to be directly related to the amount of nereocystis that's already out there. So by having those little tiny bars that persist, because it's not 100%, that already increases the likelihood of recovery. Um, and so there, there's also another factor that came in, that comes into play here. Um, we, there, there, the, the, the warm water blob in 2014, 2016 was, there was an interaction between warm water and the loss of uh, the predator, Pycnopodia helenthoides. And this predator is, um, if you're from, there's a really basic part of ecology, predator prey dynamics. If you lose a predator, the prey is gonna go up. Um, you lose the prey, the predator is gonna go down. So by losing the predator, um, there, there already is less of a, uh, a ecological uh, trophic um, uh, control of, of this grazing uh, urchin. And we're looking at this purple urchin over here um, because everyone, everyone's heard about these urchin barons. Um, and so 
because of the 2013 sea star wasting syndrome, we had a, a, a complete, almost complete collapse of the uh, of this the sunflower star, and this they they were hit much harder than than the bull kelp, um, especially in you know central and in northern California, and consequentially, uh, when you have uh, two bad things happen at once, uh, things aren't always linear. And this interaction really was consequential for the kelp, um, more so in Northern California than Central California. And so let's let's talk a little bit about um, the consequences of that increased um, urchin those urchin numbers. So this this is a study uh, that Harold and Reed in 1985, where they looked at urchin barren in Southern California and. Uh, to put things into perspective, urchin barrens are not are not a new thing. They are an alternate stable state. They are a stable state of the seafloor, where you have a healthy kelp forest, and then you have an urchin barren. And historically, we've we've seen things like this happen after um, the El Nino. Um, 1981, you have one site that was less affected. You have another site that changed into a barren. And if you look in the y-axis, we're talking about the movement rate of these urchins. These urchins get hungry, they roam around, um, and they look for whatever they can. If they don't have, if they're in a kelp site, they don't move around a lot because they're provided with a lot of drifting seaweeds, in particular drift kelp. And so, from this 1981 to 1982, you see that the barren site they start they stop moving. This was a this was a result of them being supplied more and more drift kelp, um, and the as a consequence or as a consequence the the stable state changed from an urchin barren back into a kelp forest. So let me tell you some good news. Urchin barrens can go back to kelp forests. That's that's just something that has historically happened. Um, they, they, so they put this model back together. Um, again, we're talking about the low drift abundances associated with a barren area. We're talking about severe storms, low nutrients, and, and high water temperatures uh, uh, shifting this kelp forest to a barren area. But then we're also talking about uh, the, the switch back to uh, a kelp forest where um, benign storms uh, uh, high nutrients, low temperatures associated with the La Nina, so it's, uh, essentially what we've been seeing over the last couple of years. Uh, that's been, that has been associated in addition with high drift abundance with a transition back to a kelp forest. Now, now hold on, we're, we're, this, was, this is in Southern California, this is in Central California. And so this winter predictor change when when we're talking about this this warm water blob if, if you look in the right this the prediction of the model deviated uh, uh pretty drastically from what was actually measured from this recovery so we have a a change that was not representative anymore of this model and this was a consequence of of the this interaction of this loss of this predator as well as this prolonged heat wave and so it seems like from 1990 to, to, to 2013, those conditions are a little bit different than what we're experiencing now. Now, the good news is that the, again, these, these measurements of canopy are not at zero. So, so hang in there, hang in there for now. Um, there is a little bit of blip in 2020, you know, it might've it might gone down after that. There is some recovery, there is some recovery. Um, and again, we're talking about annual kelps. Um, they rely on this annual replenishment. So that's, that's, that might have been one of the reason why, uh, why it, it deviated from that prediction. Um, and so, so if we're looking at this in a larger context, this is, this is really basic ecology. We're looking at um, the inter interaction diagram, um, urchins eat the kelp. The predators eat the urchins, and then the predators are directly positively influencing the kelp. And so, again, when you have um, a, a loss of a predator um, in Northern California, then you, you 
you're going to see a consequence. In other regions, for example, Southern California, there is uh, what's called uh, functional redundancy, where you have another predator step in. Uh, Central California, you have some otters. Southern California, you have sheephead, uh, the spiny lobster. Um, there isn't really a significant predator that compares to the Pycnopodian in Northern California. And so more about a little bit more about uh, urchin barrens. Uh, consequentially, when you have a, a southern, uh, when you have a, a, a healthy forest um, and you lose the kelp, you're going to see a drastic change in uh, the community composition. Why? Because kelps are referred to as foundation species or particularly um, bull kelp, uh, canopy kelps, bull kelp and uh, the giant kelp uh, uh, macrocystis are uh, foundation species. So when you lose it, you, you change the entire food web of the system. When you transform from a healthy kelp forest down to an urchin barren, you, you transform uh, the, whole, the whole system and you lose these whole groups of species. Um, one of those is the abalone, um, particularly in Southern California and this food web. And that's why actions were taken to close down the abalone fishing, fishery in 2016. Um, not only do those groups uh, get lost, you have a loss of other species within other groups. So loss of whole groups of species and then loss of other species. And so again, the, the functional redundancy we have in Central California, we have these sea otters, um, we have a little bit of a different um, set of conditions. Um, we have the giant kelp instead of the, the, the bull kelp neurocystis. And this was a study done from 2017 to 2019. They looked at all the, the locations on the left and they looked at, they went out to these sites and looked at the transitions, what, what, whether they went to barrens or whether they went to forests. And what they found was that if urchins were above a, a number, 2.71 urchins per meter squared, this was determined statistically, then there was a 50% probability that the, the shift was gonna be from a kelp forest to an urchin barren. Um, other, other work has shown, uh, and for example, down in Southern California, Palos Verde, that if you bring the urchins down to below two per meter squared, then there has been observed shifts from a barren back to a forest. And I'll get into that further, but at least in, um, if you look in the bottom near the x-axis on the graph on the right, the green is gonna be the transitions from barren back to forest, and the purple is gonna be from forest uh, back uh, to barren. And so anything to the left of that, of that line or the left of, of two is going to essentially transform, they, they tr it did transform from a barren back to a forest. So, you know, this is, this is a good indicator that, you know, when you lose the urchins, when the urchin populations go down, then the likelihood of recovery is going to increase. And so again, just to, just to put the point across, urchin barrens are not simply located um, in the Northeast Pacific. All of these circles are urchin barrens. They have been historically, um, this is a meta-analysis in 2014. And all these circles are, have been uh, recorded urchin barren work in urchin barrens, uh, recording either um, uh, multiple phase shifts in pink, uh, single phase shifts in purple, um, or in light purple, the kelp should be there, but it's actually a barren. And so in, in context, the dark green is going to be where the, the historic um, where the predicted uh, range, geographic range of kelps are gonna be. And the light green is the, the, the functionally sim similar um, communities that resemble, resemble kelps. So that's a lot of kelp on the coast. Um, and you see that these, this, this type of work, there's been a lot of work with barrens um, and, and they're sort of specific um, to the type of urchin um, that is, is local that, to the region, um, as well as the, the, the oceanographic conditions, the, the local ecology, um, as well as um, the, 
the uh, yeah the, the predators that that are present in the system. So let me go forward. And so um, let's see. I think those lines are going to be there. I don't know how they got there. Um, but we have a this is this is also a meta analysis done in 2016, looking at these this all of this kelp around the world, and in relation uh, from 20 from 1983 over to 2012, we see an average decline um, in in kelp across the world uh, over that range. And so this this you see that. Um, all the all the little black dots and the black line; those are the individual data points that that are deter that determine this loss. So there are some on the left of this line, and there are also some on the right. If we're looking at northern and central California, that is a little bit to the left of this line. And really importantly, this um, this meta analysis was conducted uh, ending in 2012. So this was before the, that heat wave. And so there have been a number of, of, of state responses to this, um, you know, these, these reactionary responses to the prolonged absence of kelp um, in Northern California. We're looking at the, the closure of the red abalone fishery, um, emergency increases in urchin collection bag limits, um, looking at disaster relief fund for commercial urchin divers. Um, one, one, one other thing on that point, um, when the urchin when the urchins go into a barren state, they're they're going and they're running around. Uh, they actually they they persist for for a really long time because they have the ability to downregulate everything inside their shell, and so all their inner tissues uh, they they shrink in size and they're they're still running around like 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 crazy and and so when you're an urchin diver and you're collecting urchins for their insides, there, there are pretty severe consequences to uh, what you can collect um, because, of, because each urchin is gonna, gonna have less, less meat in it. Um, so disaster relief funds for commercial urchin divers. Um, there's a Mendocino par partnership, uh, including urchin removal efforts. Um, a statewide kelp recovery research program, some some earmarked funds in the state budget for kelp recovery, and then har and also harvest restrictions that are recently put in place for bull kelp in spring and summer. So that um, I think the idea behind those was so that they can put out as much reproductive tissue, get those spores to the ground before um, before there's any collection. And so let me let me transition a little bit into some previous work that's been done. Um, we're looking at, at three, um, three separate pieces, Puget Sound up in Washington on the far left, these pyramids, uh, Mendocino uh, work that uh, this is Noyo, um, and uh, they, they also, there is uh, two sites, Noyo and, and Albion, as well as uh, Fredrickson 2020 in the bottom right, which is in Norway. They looked at um, how to make be turned back into A through the use of a really unique uh, concept called green gravel. We're going to get into that. And so we have, let me move this, we have a Puget Sound Restoration Fund where what they did was they used a little bit of aquaculture techniques themselves. They used uh, these seed strings that are uh, these spools that were seeded with kelp and they wrap them around those pyramids that I showed you. And so what you're looking at here is in, in Puget Sound, they drop this pyramid with the seed string in and these individual kelps, um, they started growing. And essentially they started developing. You can see that there are the little stipes, some of the stipes on the individuals, you can see the mattresses developing. Um, they drop this in a really, uh, what appears to be a, a fairly, um, ungrazed area, but they had some great success in getting these to, um, to develop underwater. So this is just one example of the use of, this is offshore, seed strings are offshore as opposed to land-based. 
uh, use of offshore aquaculture to get these um, to get these growing. The sad news is that once these individuals got to the surface, there was a freshwater influence that essentially um, destroyed the canopy before they can go reproductive. Um, unfortunate news. Um, so moving on to uh, the Mendocino research, uh, the, the restoration over there and the research conducted. Um, so there was an OPC funded partnership um, uh, with Reef Check, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Waterman's Alliance, the, the Noyo Center and Dega Marine Labs and the Nature Conservancy and they looked at urchin removals and going back to that, that Palos Verdes number, that, that two, two urchins per meter squared, is that really all it takes to bring the kelp back? So they, they did this over um, a little bit more than a year um, and we're looking at, uh, we're looking, let me move this. We're looking at the restoration um, site on the on the top three graphs and the control site in the bottom graph. And in, in gold, you have the original conditions pre-removal. You see that the urchin numbers are above five. Um, they, they, so they, they, while in the control site, the urchin numbers increased, the purple urchins increased, you have a, a decrease due to commercial divers um, efforts in, in NOIL to, to remove all these urchins, uh, quite a substantial amount of work. Um, number of vessels, I think there were seven vessels total. Um, and, and yeah, um, considerable amount of work. Um, and as you can see in the following year, in summer, you have some recovery. So this is, this is, a, great, this is a great sign that removal of urchins to below two meters squared has resulted in some recovery of bulk kelp. This is great news. Um, Albi the and this is this is the recovery over here in the in the in the right and over an Albion. Unfortunately, this started a little bit later. It's still um, undergoing. I don't have the, the final data set. Um, there there was considerable more uh, larger number of urchins um, over there. And there wasn't as great of a response. There's a little blip over there, um, but there wasn't as great a response um, in in the recovery over there. Uh, but again, the, the, these these removals over there are continuing. Um, so just hang in tight. The the work that I'm going to be talking about is actually going to also be in Albion. So uh, those removals uh, have have uh, Moss Landing partnered up to do. Um, uh, to to put down put out some the experimental site over there in associated with those uh, restoration removals as well. Um, so uh, some takeaways from this: um, the timing of to do this is is critical. Um, is was was this recovery simply uh, was this was this uh, influenced by the Great La Nina year? Um, is it, it, yeah, there's there's a lot of questions um, that are that are still unknown, um, but uh, the, it's it's really it's it's possible and and it's going to be important to explore the feasibility of scaling up urchin removals um, to other locations um, as well as figuring out you know uh, how is this going to be um, uh, economically feasible. Um, and, and essentially cost effective. Um, and furthermore, there is, is this, is it possible to enhance this with some addition of, of a spore solution or green gravel or something? I'll talk about green gravel in a second. Um, are there, are there, can you add bulk help to the system to make a recovery um, uh, stronger? And, and so, Let's let's move forward. And so and so this this work in in Norway was is green gravel. And so this essentially they took the the reproductive structures and they put them on rocks and they grew them and they tossed them out. Now there there is a um, a considerable uh, 
difference between this work and the work I'm going to be talking with, because this work was with uh, the sugar kelp, which is a, a, a prostrate kelp uh, on the seafloor uh, compared to a canopy kelp. And um, this is in much calmer conditions compared to the North Coast. And so um, there's a lot more work um, that's being done. And um, there's a lot of, of content that um, you can access here. Um, let, me, let me put this in the chat real quick. Um, yeah, check out check out these websites um, for a lot of a lot more information. Um, Kelp Force Alliance has um, for all it has it has um, an input for if you if you've been involved in restoration you you can put your project in there. So a number of people have been involved with Kelp Force restoration, and you can see um, the the extent success the failures of these of these um, efforts. Um, I wish it were that simple to tell you that that restoration is easy, but this is this is still a new thing. So, um, yeah, we're we're still uh, the 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 kelp restoration um, specialists are still um, trying to perfect the best method, trying trying to figure out what works for what, because this is this is it's very site specific, it's very species specific. And um, it's the timing is is really important. You have to you have to do this at a, at the at a right year. Um, there's more to say, but moving on to conservation aquaculture at Moss Landing, and can aquaculture facilitate kelp recovery? And a quick uh, Google Scholar search of aquaculture restoration and kelp pulls up this little gem. Aquaculture, aquacultural techniques for creating and restoring beds of giant kelp. 1976, kelp beds have dwindled or disappeared since 1940. We have developed a number of aquaculture techniques to reverse trends of deterioration. So this concern of kelp declining has, has it, this is not, it, people have thought about this before, but there has been recovery in the past that has really stymied the, uh, a lot of, um, of, of follow-up efforts. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, but, this is, but, this, but this idea has been, has been uh, tossed around before. So to put this in the context, aquaculture consists of the whole life cycle of kelp. And I just want to reiterate bull kelp range in sizes. We're talking about 10 microns of the spores that you see on the left to these really small gametophytes that you're seeing in uh, C through E. Uh, the egg itself, all these scale bars are 10 microns. The egg itself is really small. And then you have your germinated um, sporophyte, that canopy kelp, I, uh, 40 microns. Uh, so it, they can even be smaller. And so we're looking at really small individuals. Um, and as you can see here, there are a lot of other species that uh, are, are growing in. And, and, and despite that, um, kelps can, can persist through this. So these are some of the challenges that we have to deal with uh, when we're looking at aquaculture. Is there a way to, to, to do this through those other species? As they develop, you can see a gametophyte on the top left. This is a, a really old gametophyte that has grown and persisted for a long time. Um, and you see between the two lines, that's one millimeter. And these, these individuals are on a uh, dissecting scope. And so we have, um, these. this is without the scope. These are really small individuals um, in the culturing process. Eventually these grow up and they have this identifier, the, the nematocyst, as well as the blade splits. Um, and then they grow up in the canopy. They, they, they have these two, these two growth phases. They have the, the stipe elongation phase where when they're underwater, they're growing up really quickly. Um, we're looking at a, a quarter of a meter per day and they, their whole point is to get up to the surface. And once they hit um, the, the, uh, the surface waters, then 
they're going to be switching into a, a reproductive mode where they put on sori and then they form that that canopy that that er, that everyone has seen off the coast. And so when we're when we're talking about aquaculture, how do you get these huge kelps in land-based systems? This is this seems like it's not really doable, right? So let's let's take a step back and, and go into these land-based systems. So this is not offshore farming. We're doing this in tanks. We're doing this in tanks and we're doing this um, on land. And the premise is we're using tumble culture um, as a way to grow these, these species. So the premise behind tumble culture is you have air at the bottom of a tank that is essentially an airlift pump that, that circulates uh, the water and whatever's in the water in a, in a, in a cell, uh, a three-dimensional cell, so that everything in the water is going to be exposed to the same amount of light. Now, it's not for aerating the seaweed. It's for both breaking down, uh, it, it's for, for moving the water so that the seaweed can absorb uptake nutrients, as well as exposing each seaweed to the same amount of light. And so we have a flow through seawater through through the surface through this supply that goes down the drain in, in the end. So this is a, these are flow through tanks, essentially taking ocean water and growing growing them in, um, in that ocean water. And so how do we do this? How do we? Is there a way that we can that we can do this? Spoiler alert: there is a way. Um, and is this bull kelp green gravel? idea. This is, this is our idea. Can we, can we grow bull kelp on green gravel and have the same, uh, is, it, is it going to be as effective as the, as the sugar kelp that was grown in Norway? These are, again, this is, restoration can be species specific. This is a, uh, bull kelp is a monster. It's, it's a big kelp and, and the North Coast is not a very common, placid, lake um, as, as our other places. Um, so is this really going to work? So let me, let me, sh so that's, that's our whole premise behind uh, this, this aquaculture uh, contribution um, to the partnership of the restoration um, in Albion, um, sort of following up on, on uh, the Mendocino work up there. And so let, I'm going to tell you how we do the whole thing. Uh, this, these were taken from um, uh, phy phycological methods to uh, culturing. And again, we're going to be taking these reproductive structures of the large kelp, um, and we're going to be stressing them out so that they release spores. You put them in seawater. And in the far right, you see this, the, the seawater solution. That's not um, turbid because of the, the things because of sand that's turbid because those are all the spores those are the billions of spores that are released from these structures from these reproductive structures and so the goal is to get these reproductive structures um, in this tank so uh, there has been work in 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 incubators doing this in petri dishes but this is one of the first um, um, attempts to do this inside of tumble culture and um, so essentially we inoculated these tanks and we had some pretty great success where um, these kelps grew to a, uh, in pretty dense numbers in, uh, uh, to a substantial size. So yeah, this is this whole tank wall, these whole tank walls are essentially surrounded. Um, and so eventually we scrape these off and they're floating around in suspension we adjust the light so that they're more acclimated to um, the outside light. Remember, we're doing all this outside on land. And these, these guys develop. These are, these are, this is probably the coolest thing that um, of my talk, in my opinion, just being able to see these little tiny features. This is the, this is the morphological development that differentiates bull kelp from all other kelps. The two, the two pictures on the left, all other kelps will look like that at that size. And, and then this is bull kelp only because it starts to develop that manises right there. You see that little tiny bulge at the end of the stipe? That is bull kelp right there. 
And then you can see as it grows a little bit larger, the nematocyst starts to, to fill out a little bit, stipe gets a little bit larger. And then you see those three lines, which is gonna be in, indicative of the blade splits. And so bottom left, um, you have these, these the nematocyst is, is coming in really nicely. Um, we actually ended up um, culturing these um, concurrently at the seaweed farm and selling these, which is what that picture was in the introduction. And you get these really cool in the middle, you get these really cool bull kelps. Um, but then there's a problem in the, in the right where they start entangling. And because tumble culture relies on moving these through the water in the cell, when you have the nematocyst that is, that is um, filled with air it's, and, and you have a lot of entanglement, uh, you're gonna get a essentially a canopy of these, uh, which the bull kelp do not like. And so we had a lot of mortalities based on this condition, this entanglement condition. So this was sort of the breakthrough that, um, in my opinion, um, opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, no, nope, not this slide. So this is this, yeah, this is this is the issue here. But this is the this is the breakthrough right here. If you cut the nematocyst in half, this bull kelp will grow as if the rest of the individual was still there in tumble culture. Now, if you did this in the wild, it'll end up in the beach. It'll end up um, in the seafloor and it'll either not get enough light and die or it'll desiccate and, and be a, a terrestrial subsidy. But in these tumble culture tanks, it's getting enough light, it's getting enough nutrients, it's gonna keep developing. So we have these, we call them crowned bull kelps. These are crowns, we call them crowns. Um, and so these crowns keep on developing, they grow larger and then they grow larger and they develop sori. And this is, this is fantastic. We completed the life cycle of nereocystis in tumble culture and they keep growing and they develop these, these wonderful sori that this, this sorrel bank that can be, in my opinion, a great tool for, for the way that aquaculture can provide, um, can facilitate restoration efforts. You put these in the water and they're gonna be releasing spores. You stress them out a little bit, put them in the water, they're gonna be releasing spores. So the potential here is to facilitate restoration efforts, or to really see if the, the dispersal is simply the limiting factor. And so again, these can get really large. We're looking at five meter blades, half a meter sori. Um, these, are, these, are, these can get really large individuals. And, and furthermore, they can persist just as blades. So in, in from the crowns, you know, they eventually deteriorate months down the line into blades where they have, um, I call them antlers. There's no, there's no real name for them, but that's where the, the blades attach to the matices. When those antlers decay, you have, um, you have these blades uh, um, separating, but they're still, they're still growing. And so the idea is we were going to, to also do green gravel. And so we use these to go through, we use a soil bank to go through another spore release onto these substrates. So two possible concerns for substrates in the North Coast. Um, are the bull kelps going to attach to the rock? The whole fast grows pretty fast. So that isn't as big of a concern, but are the substrates going to stay put? So again, timeliness is a key. If you put this out, in October, maybe not. In the summertime, maybe. So we did a spore inoculation in these. This was actually an earlier one with some other substrates, but you get the picture. Uh, you have this really, this really dense spore solution into these, um, into these tanks. And then eight to 10 weeks later, you have um, these the green gravel producing sporophytes. And these, these develop um, into um, into bull kelps attached to this rock. And so our 
the the general idea uh, for the experimental design is to um, look at whether small substrates, large substrates, um, or these sori bags influence recovery. And we want we we really thought that the following up on the Mendocino partnership of, of earth removals was, was a great um, contribution. Um, we meaning the whole partnership of this, this work. Um, and so we also have some controls um, to look at whether or not natural recruitment influences. Essentially all these three, all these, these treatments are randomized on these lines. And on the right, you have the removal side. This, this sort of coincides with, um, in, in orange, um, well, this coincides with the work um, done by the Mendocino partnership. Um, and on the left, you have the urchin um, not remove control where all of this is done in both spots to see whether or not urchin removals um, can possibly be obviated, um, wh wh whether they're not, they, they might not be necessary. And so, um, we, we went out to um, the ocean and we um, luckily we were able to, to utilize some of the, the some of the infrastructure from the pre, from the previous work um, but we had to do a significant amount of, of experimental design layout we had to put all, out all these lines um, and, and and drill these these holes for our eye bolts and we had to um, we had to lay all this out so that when it becomes really uh, turbid, when there's a lot of swell, we don't get lost. We know how to get back to our sites, um, to our to our locations for each of our treatments. And so, remember, this is this is. Uh, we 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 were not we would not be able to do this without the help um, of commercial divers because this this is a huge effort by commercial divers in removing um, these these urchins over at Albion. There was there was a large number, um, and I, I I I don't quite remember how many vessels um, were involved. I think it was two in the Mendocino work, um, but essentially there's there's a lot of effort. Um, going on here um, to uh, to upkeep um, these these sites, and so um, we the the urchin uh, eff the removal efforts are ongoing, and recently we we got to the point where we're 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 taking this gravel out there and we're putting it out there, and so this is a lot this is a lot of effort in itself. Um, we're dumping these these at, at all of our treatments in the midst of, of some urchins still being out there. And we have appropriate controls. You can see the little white rocks. We have to, we have to count those to see, you know, uh, the, the efficacy of this in summer. How many are lost? What are the percentage that are remaining? Um, just as an assessment method, you know, how many of these, when you put them out are going, are, are are they going to be effective? How many are going to be lost? Even in calm waters in Norway, they lost a considerable amount. So, you know, we don't necessarily, we don't take a, a magnifying lens out there, but we're going by hand counting these. Um, and I, when I say we, I'm, I'm at this point, uh, I'm a vol I'm, I volunteer some of my time. So this is, there's, there are um, a number of other more dedicated than me um, divers uh, that, that, maintain this this um, these this deployment and so we also go out there we put those reproductive structures the sori into these bags um, and these so regardless of what structure of the bulk help is out there these urchins are it's 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 a they're magnets to these to these urchins uh, these remember these urchins roam around they're looking for food um, and then, and then the, the process is ongoing. We're going through monitoring still. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's pretty much where we're at on, on this. I don't have any data again. Um, we're, we're continuing um, uh, 
the, the field work. Uh, we have an, uh, another substrate deployment. Um, we have probably until the end of the year or until we get some, some uh, good amount of uh, data. Um, but we're also going to be doing stuff at, at Moss Landing, um, looking at uh, the growth rates of these individuals in tanks to, and the reproductive output to really to, to get this metric down, to get how much infrastructure do you need to maintain this bank. Um, we're, gonna, we're probably going to be doing also some genetic um, work looking at parentage analysis um, where we uh, take samples of our tissue that that the, the sori that we produce at Moss Landing and we, when we put them out there and then combine them. Uh, remember this, so so all of these, the, the stuff that we produced at Moss Landing was taken from um, Albion River. I didn't mention that. Um, but we're we're starting we're starting local. Um, so, but there's there's enough um, genetic difference between um, two sites um, in in Albion um, enough uh, if we have uh, samples to to determine um, parentage. So the idea is to see whether or not um, the recruits at the site um, if they if they hit the surface. You know, did they come from our work or was that a natural um, uh, recruitment? Remember, um, at the work at Noyal, you had natural recruitment after urchins were removed. And so there's, again, there's more outplanning and monitoring going on. Um, and so some of these implications, um, aquaculture is, has a real potential to, to add to, to some of these restoration efforts where all you need is water and sunlight and um, some mechanical filtration. And there is, uh, you can complete the life cycle. We've actually gone through, uh, I think four generations now within um, our own tanks. Um, and so you have the ability to grow these large mature um, canopy kelps, the sporophytes in these, in these um, relatively small tanks. And so the spore bank again, it's that's really the 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 meat of 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 the potential um, using that for either site specific restorations um, or and then and then using that to maintain a culture. For example, if we're looking at more deterioration, it'd be good to have uh, the spore bank. Um, say that there's another uh, warm water event, right after that warm water event would be a good time to, to utilize that. Um, and, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't apply to the North Coast, but utilizing this for other restoration um, efforts for other kelps is also um, uh, a potential as well. Again, the, the, so these are, these are the little kelps inside of this, this dense uh, sort of dirty culture. And so again, we're, we're looking at the potential for scalability. Um, we're looking at this being a potential restoration supplement. Uh, those little, in the satellite data, remember those little blips, those might be targets to, to bolster. Um, there might be something special about those blips. It might be a good site um, specific place to, to enact restoration. That was why uh, Noyo and Albion were chosen um, and really finding the, the timeliness to do this is important. Um, there are other possibilities, um, and I really, I sort of want to open it up and try to, try to think about uh, more of this, trying to, trying to have uh, a, a discussion here. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much um, all I had to say. Uh, there's a lot of partners that, that go into this. Um, you know, OPC, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Sea Grant, uh, uh, Nature Conservancy, Waterman's Alliance, all the urchin divers. Um, yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of people that, a lot of work, a lot of man hours, um, person hours that have gone into this. And so um, that's it. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Was I on mute the whole time? <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, Sarah, sorry, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, that was fantastic. Really, really 
awesome stuff you're working on. And exciting, like the moment when you see the little tiny, teeny, tiny nematocyst, it's like it's that I can't imagine <laughs> the feeling when you saw that. That must yeah. have been like one exciting day. <laughs> They're so cute. They're so, so cute. I love to photograph the little ones when they come in. I think I've never seen one as small as that. I've had, you know, the little tiny ones. Super cool. So we do have questions in the chat pouring in and I can, um, I can read them um, out to you or if you want to read them yourself, whatever you want to do is fine with me. Um, however you want to take it is fine by me. Yeah, so um, what is the status of potentially bringing sea otters or other purple urchin predators to the Albion coast? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, you'll have to check in with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife with that. I think there, that's the, that's the obstacle to, um, to, for predator transplantation. That's a, that's a huge step because really you have to consider the whole ecosystem um, and the potential downsides to that. Um, so I, I can tell you that there are some uh, restoration efforts uh, for the the sunflower star, um, so that that is undergoing that is um, uh, underway right now. They, they have a really complex life cycle as well. Um, I, I haven't really been keeping up with those efforts, but um, yeah, other predators. That's a that's a tough one. That's that would I'm not sure if that is feasible. Um, in, introducing another species that's not that's not native be, because there are there could be consequences historically uh, when people have done that um, with with ecosystems uh, not in the ocean there have been there have been consequences to um, the uh, to populations the communities um, yeah, part of that, like that was where when, when Noyo Center did our first education in the schools, talked about the urchin problem and all of this, and it was a very popular topic to talk about the urchin, the otters coming back and it, you know, Department of Fish and Wildlife, I think, has considered it for many years, but it's really, it's, it's, it's wouldn't be, even though the otters were here historically, bringing them back to this depleted kelp forest ecosystem has pretty much kind of said, you know, that that just might not, they, they wouldn't do so well here. And adding, kind of, I, anyway, it hasn't seen, I haven't heard it presented as a very good idea at this time. And where my latest answer is, you know, we can go out there and collect, you know, a lot more urchins and, and get real hungry for urchins. So let's be, let's be human urch, uh, otters and and start eating these urchins um they're delicious i i get them yeah they're a bit depleted but they're still really delicious and i've got interns that'll take them home and make sushi rolls so the urchins i think they're good i encourage people to get really hungry uh for urchins themselves and and be those missing predators we humans can be those missing predators i think that's just my personal thought but there's, there's another interesting um thing that happens in uh, in the Monterey Bay, these these urchin, uh, sorry, these the, the otters, um, remember when, they, when the urchin barrens occur, these urchins downregulate their insides. And um, yeah, as Sarah was saying, that um, you have the, these these otters actually they they don't select for urchins because they know that there isn't going to be a lot of meat in them. And so um, we're not entirely sure when that's going to return, but they're like, for example, in the paper that I they presented um, uh, were with the, with the 2.7 uh, urchins per square meter to a barren, uh, what he said was um, that the, the otters actually, they, they helped some of these little tiny areas um, at the border there, and they ate they ate the urchins there, and so they they helped um, the the transition zones, um, and so there there was so the otters might not necessarily um, benefit; they might not do so so well as Sarah was saying. In if you if you reintroduce them um, back into the the area, 
Yeah, and then um, let's see, are you aware of any efforts to plant kelp in Northern California? Like, I mean, it, it looks like, yes. Yes, um, this is, yeah, this, this work, um, the OPC funded work um, is, is one of those efforts. Um, yes. What can local divers do? Um, that is a good question. And really, um, the best answer is to coordinate and to 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 figure out how um, how the greater um, set of hours can be distributed. And there there are others. There there's some other work um, uh, going on here um, that that might. There's some other uh, um, people that will have a better answer for you than this, but really uh, grouping all the effort into um, a, a, a single project is going to have a more substantial um, long-term effect on, on a location. Uh, one of the ideas could be to, to select a single location and continue continued, um, it's in, in science, we call it a press manipulation. You're gonna manipulate this little tiny little area by taking all the urchins out. And we're talking about a substantial area enough so that you have a kelp recovery, um, but, but just it needs to be repetitive. It needs to, it needs, there need to be um, a, no urchins in that area. And I'm not, I'm not saying do that. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that that's one of the things that could be done. Um, really the most substantial thing to help would be to coordinate with some of the other um, um, uh, people uh, that are more active in, in, in the, the removal of purple urchins. Um, yeah, it looks like we were, we've been doing kind of a concerted effort looking for the sunflower stars here with the Noya Center. Um, and over the last low lows um, in June and July. And people are noticing some urchins with the perhaps balding or black spot, I'm not sure, um, and photographing those and wondering, you know, kind of looking at that. I know it's out of your, your kelp range, but um, yeah. looking at the urchins sort of spiking and maybe, maybe because they're so populated if there's some disease being noticed, we've seen some, but really not very much. So, so let me tell you, historically, um, diseases have been a stressor that has pushed urchin barons back into kelp forest. So I don't want to sound bad, but you know, this could be a really good thing. Um, I'm not, I, I don't want to jump the gun. Um, I'm not going to say that this is going to switch it back, but um, yeah, there's, there's been precedent that, um, that disease has resulted in the, the removal of urchins, uh, the deaths of urchins, and that has alleviated pressure um, on kelp forest uh, for these are the, the kelp forest recovery. So there has been a, a, a phase shift back to a, a kelp, kelp forest. Nice. I like that. Was that, that. A, photo, that a oh. photo of a diver with a drill? Yeah, that was um, Ian Norton um, with, uh, with the drill. And yeah, there's that's an underwater electric drill um, that we we've used. Um, very expensive, um, and <laughs> there there have been yeah. If there there are always problems when you put metal in the water, and so the, that drill is not um, <laughs> it is not uh, you know it's it's not. Uh, it, it, it had problems. I could imagine, but it looks like we've got lots of questions. Um, thank you. And uh, Liza says she learned a ton and it's a relief to learn that there's progress on finding viable restoration techniques. It is, it is. It, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to even be infused with a slight bit of hope because it shifts the, it shifts it, it, it uh, you know, hope is, hope is good. And I, I tend to be a hopetarian, but when I get a little infusion of this kind of work that somebody's doing, that people are doing, that 
you're putting out there, it just, it, it does that. It does, it gives me that, that zing of hope, which I think we all really need. Um, is there some definitive outcomes related to the removal of the urchins? I think you, you kind of addressed that. Yeah, so I, I would point you to um, the, the Mendocino Partnership uh, report, and I, I linked it up in the chat. Um, that is, uh, oh, maybe I didn't put it up there. Um, it's in the Kelp Forest Alliance Restoration Projects. Um, if you search for uh, Noyo, I believe. Great. Um, it's, it's online free, so just, just check it out. Just do a whole bunch of queries for that. Yeah, there's so much that is out there that that is available to to kind of look through and see what different people are doing. It's such a it's a neat thing to see such a concerted effort from different different organizations coming together around this. Um, and then Mary asks, thank you, Daniel, for a wonderful presentation and really great to see the photos as you went along. So interesting to see the growth on the stipe and the differences between the non-canopy kelps. Um, and how did the kelp recover so quickly in areas that were that were urchin barrens? Yeah, or, that's a that's a tough one. Um, uh, again, there's there this phase shift um, between urchin barren and kelp forest is is different uh, among species. So. Uh, historically, we've been looking at El Ninos as some of the, 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 the impetus for this phase shift uh, to urchin bearing. But then when you have those, those really good years where the kelp um, recovered, when you have uh, diseases uh, with urchin populations, when you have more of a, uh, a predator uh, influence on some of the patchy urchin bearing kelp forest areas, like in Central California, then you have uh, more of uh, energy to bring it to bring it back, um, and so there there are locations where they recover more quickly. There are times when they recover more quickly. There's a lot of variables in play. Um, let's see. I want to make sure that if you see any of these questions, that um, Joelle says, I'm so impressed with the collaboration of many conservation organizations to bring light to the importance of ocean ecology on the Mendocino coast. Absolutely agree. Diane Hichwa says, when otters were moved after all the oil spill in Prince William Sound, the otters went back to where they had been. Yeah, and that those northern sea otters are a different Different. They may have once have been one species, but the separation of the northern sea otter and the southern sea otter and the different challenges that they face. One of the biggest challenges right now for them to come north of San Francisco, even though the, the southern sea otter is exploring a little bit north of San Francisco, it's got this shark alley that they've got to get past and otters get bit by sharks a lot. And so there's a lot of sharks around those rookeries, those pinniped rookeries in the Bay Area. And that, to my understanding, is one of the problems with them actually moving up and getting beyond that really shark intensive area. Um, and then, you know, the northern ones have different challenges. But um, anywho, that's, that's kind of what I know. And it's just such a hot topic. Everybody wants that sea otter to come back. And I'm just like, you know, if they're, historically, even before this problem, I remember hearing like, why don't we have the sea otters? Well, sea otter is also really, really hungry for great big purple urchins. They're hungry for the same things that are, that are fishery items that we all really like to eat, abalone, and, and whatnot. And in, in my work with responding to dead marine mammals, uh, there are industries that really don't want to have any sort of a competitor to, say, abalone harvesting or, or um, urchins. So that's another reason why uh, they were not, we didn't really want them back here, according if, to if, some people. If I were an otter and I had to choose between an urchin, barren urchin, and an abalone, like the ones that I've seen out there, I would definitely go for the abalone. Really good point. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see, Ian, recreational divers with valid fishing license can participate in urchin culling in South Casper Cove. Visit the Waterman's Alliance on Facebook page. So that's 
an area where you can, I've got one of my interns who goes out there and, and just jumps in and gets his urchin and, and he loves urchin and eats it up. And uh, we've been bringing those urchin into the Noya Center for people to kind of, kids love to hold urchins because urchins wiggle around on your hands and they're, they're fun to explore and look at. So that's, that's another great thing to do. I've got my fishing license and I'm excited about harvesting urchins and hey, put them on arugula, squeeze a little lime and jalapeno and you've got a little toast or something, they're delicious. So that, I feel like that's a, a good approach. Um, get out there and, but you, you know, one reason why you can't just go, everybody go down and go out and get urchins is you've got to consider if you're, if there's a bunch of people going out and getting urchins, they're also stepping on that fragile, struggling intertidal zone. So with the Casper Cove and diving, you're not presenting that problem. If you go to Buckhorn Cove where there's a fragile ecosystem that you're stomping over, take that into consideration, you know, so this, I can really see why it's a diving for them is a better approach in my opinion, but, um, and then recreational divers can also volunteer with Reef Check and Noyo Center for Marine Science. And Noyo Center's working on that bit, but we're definitely encouraging folks to get out there and do some diving. It's so beautiful. You can, Daniel, you were just out there and talking about great visibility. And I know Ian was out there as well. You were just up here and got pictures that you shared. Yeah, a few, uh, just a, a, uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah, incredible visibility we're talking about 35 feet best i've seen um and yeah it's 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 diving is is a is a is a really um it's a privilege to be able to go underwater um mm -hmm. it's not something that um humans have really been able to do for most of their existence and it's you know there's so much of the of the world the underwater world that has been unexplored and the coastal ecosystems are just this 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 rainforest of of life and it's just a really spectacular thing going through um a, a kelp forest it's just it's something that's phenomenal I, I would i would recommend everyone um learn how to dive if they can and if you can't dive, at least take in some of the the, the divers, um, you know, cinematography and photography of, of that ecosystem. If you can't, like I can't dive, I've never been able to dive because of, of lung issues, but I go into our dome at the, at the Noyo Center and, and enjoy that or the Monterey Bay Aquarium and just fantasize about diving. Um, so yeah, if you can get out there and do it. Um, one more thought here, Lawrence, actually natural abalone predators will help restore the abalone populations. It's counterintuitive, but that is how wildlife population dynamics work. Excellent point. So, so true. It's, uh, yeah, it, I wish that we humans could better understand that nature's got this in many respects, like nature Nature can, can uh, if we give it half a chance, throw a few spores out there, give it half a chance and support it. Um, it's amazing how the restoration process is, we always use the gray whale as one, how those pinnipeds and gray whales and all those went way down during hunting and then we gave them half a chance and they rebounded. And so you can see that when we jump in and do stuff, it, it can, so anyway, I, I dive <laughs> Um, any more questions here? Abalone have co coexisted with otter for ages. That's that's totally true. Yeah, so good point. Yeah, it's simple predator-prey dynamics. Right. Um, I think that's about all the questions that well, Jim, I Jim asked here. a question about Little River. Um, some de degree of recovery in 2021 winter, but then mostly sim seem to disappear. Um, so, so the kelp usually disappears um, due to winter swells. Um, sometimes it overwinters and persists until the next cohort. Um, and so we're, we're, we're really talking about recovery happening more in the, in the, in the springtime when the next cohort comes up. Um, and so if you're just looking at winter, that was, that was from uh, the 20. 
from so comparing 20 to 21, uh, there was less in 21. So I, I, I honestly, I can't tell you much. I can't tell you anything about Little River, um, but I can tell you that, again, the, the natural populations um, fluctuate as, as you looked at, as, as you saw on some of the first slides um, that I was, um, that I presented. Um, and that's, that's also, that's a natural thing, but there could also be an interaction with um, some grazing, some, some merchants there. So um, without looking at it further, without more um, data, I really can't um, speculate the, 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 the reason why it would be different. Could be, could be urchin related, it might not be. Any other questions before we bid our guest good night? And thank you, Daniel, that was really exciting. Um, thanks for sharing, giving us your time and best of luck and reach out if there's any way that we can support you as a, as a you know, citizen scientist or from shore or whatever, um, definitely support what you're doing. And um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad I got the opportunity to talk. I, I, I'm glad I got to um, uh, speak with everyone here. Yeah, super great. Thanks for giving us your evening. And really, we wish you the very best of luck. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being here for another uh, science talk. We will see you next time. <laughs>